So I kind of finished up there when we bought the 6900 John Deere. Um, around the time of the 6900 as well, we also uh, we were using our that man was doing the mowing. They had the baler, he 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 the coon trail, and we started doing the mowing. Then um, we bought a class trail mower, which um, we had up until we bought the triples, and. Um, People don't rate those class mowers at all, but we were at we bar bar we done beardings on an outside hat. We never opened the bit of that class mower or we never opened the gearbox. Um I'd say definitely one of the best machines we ever had because it was just seriously reliable. Uh, you knew any day you went out mowing with that, she was going to come back without any hiccups. So um, that's kind of what pushed us to success again. But um, that more definitely was one of the best things we ever ever had. And uh, now she had a lot of work done by the time she left. But uh, literally zero to none uh, on the trouble front. So we also started raking. We were um, just picking up, I suppose, kind of straight at that time. Our, uh, the halos were being rolled in with a hay bob. And we bought um, a single rotor um, Kieferland rake, and we—I don't think we even finished the season with that because uh, we realised it was just painfully slow raking with a single rotor rake. And trying to keep the swarts even was an actual art in itself. Um, you know, you'd be in and out, you could be in and out, and, and the road be getting wide, and the road be getting narrow, and, and it was just. It wasn't the easiest thing in the world to work with. So we moved we moved that on and we bought a Neymar twin rotor rake and that is definitely the second worst thing we've ever owned because that thing gave us serious hardship. Um, I'd say between myself and my father we've thousands of acres walked looking for the arms off of that yoke because she just fling off arms everywhere and you couldn't watch it we got into the habit of when you get to an end of a row you'd lift it and you'd, you'd count your arms then you'd see how many arms you had because it, it was just that often you were losing arms I often went out a day and I could lose four arms off of it um, it was just old and wasn't built for the real heavy crops I suppose in this country it also had an open cam track and Beard and failure in the open cam track was a common thing, uh, and they were a heavy wall bearding as well, so they were hard to get. It wasn't uh, it wasn't running in oil or grease or anything, so a bit of a disaster that way. But uh, we changed her then, and we went for a coon, and we've had the coon until we changed for the Pottinger, and the coon performed fairly well for us up all along. Um, I suppose one of the biggest downfalls of the coon would have been the joints in the tine arm it was just I suppose they were fine when they were new but whenever there was um, any bit of play came in there uh, one was kind of able to eat against the other and eventually it was able to pull out of them or break them off because they got so weak but uh, we we welded them all in the finish and that wouldn't be my favorite plan of attack welding up these kind of things but um, obviously if you were to go replacing all the arms it'd probably cost more than the rake was worth and I've never taken I've never taken a tine arm off of that coon anyway there was no need to because the way your tines were done you could take off any tine without having to take another one whereas the well, say the classes there in the pottingers you kind of they're all slid through the bar so if you have to take off a middle one you have to take off the other ones to get in at the middle one which is kind of a silly setup really but um, the coon that was one of the plus points of the coon so I suppose maybe we had the coon a year or two and that's when I went to New Zealand uh, I know I spoke about this briefly in another video but I said I give it give a bit of an in-depth uh, talk about that uh, I went there the it was the 13th of October I left the year I went there and I came back somewhere in the February, the start of March. 
um, and it was an unreal experience. Uh, I think anyone should do should do it. I was the only one. I kind of went with uh, on my own. I, I didn't go with anyone else I knew, and but it was definitely thoroughly enjoyable. I remember the first tractor I drove over there was a nine three. It was either a nine thirty or a nine three three or a nine three six and uh, woefully dead yoke, it was brand new but it did, there was no power in it whatsoever I don't know whether it takes them a bit of time to get going or what but there was just no go in her so uh, I was only driving that for a few days and that was on a four road or rake the ground over there is unbelievably hilly um, one of the first places we went if you weren't careful when you were coming down to the bottom of the hill and onto the flat bit, your weights would get stuck in the ground like, and you wouldn't be able to get out of it. So it was just crazy. I've never seen hilly ground. Like if it was in Ireland, it just wouldn't be farmed and that'd be it. Uh, but they'd farm anything over there. Uh, them boys had serious gear. They had, I think they had three, yes, they had three of their own harvesters. And there was one there from class that was being tested. Um, it was a kind of a prototype machine. And there was a prototype rake and a prototype set of mowers with them that year. But um, I suppose up until Christmas was really their busy time. It started to kind of cool off a bit after that. December was definitely the busiest month with up. But uh, still up great went through. It, like that, it was all big fins and all big John Deere's uh, stuff you wouldn't necessarily see around here. It's tiny silage trailers, then really, really small yokes that nobody'd have. Around, I'd say 16 foot would have tried them out for how long they were. Now, they, uh, obviously, they looked small compared to you know the size of the tractors they were on. I remember one day there was one of them on an A310R uh, John Deere. And if you, if anyone knows an A310R John Deere, they are huge. They're absolutely massive. And this one had jeweled wheels all around, and it was it was going around with this tiny silage trailer on it. The 16 foot silage trailer was just a, an unusual kind of a sight. He had more of a job to get the tractor in gaps than he had to get the trailer in the gaps. But a lot, most of it was drawn with lorries, uh, eight wheeler lorries. They had two of their own lorries and they kind of had a lot of hired in lorries then. A lot of local hauliers and they had these uh, bodies, you know, they were easily taken on and off. And a lot of them would have been drawing cattle and stuff like that as well. So I saw some huge farms over there. We were on one farm that had 60,000 cattle and 80,000 sheep. It was absolutely massive. Um, I only done maybe two weeks down there, but the other crew will say one of the other harvester gangs um, picked up about 5,000 of acres down there for that farm. So that'll just tell you the scale of it. Um, definitely a, a more than enjoyable experience. I'd uh, do it again if I was a younger man and I didn't have, uh, if we weren't as busy at kind of what we're at now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to devote time to, to go on there but um, like I say thoroughly enjoyable um, I don't know if there any other stories that I suppose there was a lot of what will you say uh, carnage um, the ground was so unforgiving and um, there was a lot of trailers capsized and, uh, and a lot of uh, damage done to machinery really but uh, it's, the boys over there seem to take it in their stride, they didn't take much notice, I suppose they were used to it. It's just the nature of the, of the land they were working and um, they were as cool as a breeze, definitely a very nice people to work for. Um, still, still keep in touch with them and uh, talk to them every now and again. But um, yeah, they run a lovely setup, uh, lovely people and just a lovely place really. You couldn't believe actually how rural it was. It's kind of really like even to go to a shop or anything was a bit of an ordeal. You wouldn't 
you wouldn't knock across the shop like you would here or, or anything like that. You definitely had to have a lunch made to brought with you because it was rare you'd knock across somewhere that you'd get food. Um, obviously, compared to around here, you you could just go into the shop. Like, even since I've started this video, how many settlements, I suppose you call it, have we gone through? So, that's kind of piece about New Zealand, I would say. Um, I made a good few pounds out of it and I came back and it gave me a start to get going a bit more when we came home which um, I'm very grateful for and uh, really gave me that boost that I needed to develop our own business and uh, take experience away from how they done it and, and all that kind of thing. So I suppose I'll kind of finish this one up at this and uh, I'll keep going from here with the next one.